Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kino with stemwithkino.com, and today I'm coming back at you with another video. And today we're going to talk about the electrical system in the Cessna, Cessna 152. I think um, the electrical system is probably one of the most um, un or I guess misunderstood systems of all the systems because you know, well, I won't say it's the most, but it's one of them. It's one of the most misunderstood ones because a lot of people don't really understand electrical systems. So what I've done is I brought us to the part, and you can find this in Section 7 of your pilot operating handbook. Here's the thing, all right. We have a battery and we have an alternator. Now when we start the engine, think of this battery as a full cup of water. And when we come back to the aircraft and um, we're cranking with the key, you know, just like your car, when we're cranking, we're taking some sips out of the battery, if we think of this battery as a glass of water. And then what the alternator does in turn is as the engine is spinning and is driving that alternator, it's refilling the battery with water. It's refilling it to a full glass of water. And we can see this by way of the ammeter. Okay, so we have a master switch. We have our electrical appliances, which is our communications and navigation radio, automatic direction through ADF radio, which is the automatic direction finder, the transponder. We also have some switches here that will, you know, drain or use up energy or place a load on the electrical system. Uh, we have circuit breakers um, down here on the bottom, and we have our ammeter. So these are all parts of the electrical system that I'm going to talk about. And um, so just to jump in. Um, the electrical systems found in light aircraft reflect the increased use of sophisticated avionics. And these are the avionics, radios, the electrical appliances. This, that was what we would call the avionics. In some aircraft, we have the avionics power switch that we would flip, and that would allow electrical energy to flow to these radios. But in this case, the Cessna 1752, it's a very, very... Um, sensitive or, or not sensitive but simple electrical system um, probably as simple as they get as far as aircraft go so I'm gonna go really really slow and I wanna make sure that you really clearly understand what's going on with this electrical system alright so um, since most operations in today's flight environment are highly dependent on the aircraft's electrical system you should have a clear understanding of the system and its basic components. So first we're going to talk about the alternator. Now we can't see the alternator. The alternator and the battery are buried in the engine. But if we go to the electrical schematic here on the Cessna 152, we can see it in the diagram. We can see the battery and we can see the alternator. All right. Um, so you're pretty much going to have a 14 or 20, uh, 28 volt direct current system, which is usually powered by the engine-driven alternator. All right, so there's an alternator here. And um, some older airplanes may be equipped with generators. But generators have many advantages for airplanes, such as lighter weight, lower maintenance, and you know uniform output, even at low engine RPM. Alternators produce alternating current first, then they convert it to direct current all right, for use in the system. Direct current is delivered to a bus bar. So we can see our primary and we can see our avionics bus. The primary bus goes to fuel quantity indicators, flash and beacon, pedo heat, strobe lights, a cigarette lighter, landing and taxi lights, the ignition system, and to the wing flap system. So this is separated for redundancy. Even if our primary bus uh, or if our avionics bus went down, 
uh, we should still have some functionality uh, with our ignition system. I mean, yeah, you definitely want your ignition system to be going, your landing lights. So you can see that the primary bus is dedicated to really necessary flight systems. We don't need to talk to anybody. If we lost our radios, the plane will still fly. All right. If we look at our avionics bus, we can see that uh, its its system is connected. And pay attention to these. These are the circuit breakers. Now, the circuit breakers protect the, you know, if there was an overload on this end from the alternator, okay, it would not let us fry our radios or necessary systems. The circuit breaker would actually pop out and say, hey, dude, you're giving me too much water. Okay, so think of this electrical current or this flow or uh, voltage, I should say, as water. Okay, we don't want to push too much water. Think of uh, these components as balloons. We put too much water in them, they will burst. So instead, the circuit breakers do that quote-unquote bursting, and they actually protect the components. All right. So you can have many types of bus bar accessory systems, um, but they're, they protect, uh, they're protected by the circuit breakers. And you should make sure that all electrical equipment is turned off before you even start the aircraft. So, um, I'm not going to go to the checklist, but in the checklist, um, it will tell you, you know, before we turn this key, we want to just scan our electrical instruments and make sure that, you know, our navigation and communication radios are off, our ADF or automatic direction finders off, and our transponders off. We want this stuff off. We don't want it on because it could cause problems. So when we turn or we start the electrical energy of the water flowing through the system, if you would, all right, we don't want any surge to uh, go on. We don't want to pop the circuit breakers either. Okay, so we're very, it's a very gentle approach to powering things up. This protect this protects sensitive components, particularly the radios, from damage that may be caused by random voltages generated during the starting process. So we just discussed that. Okay, so let's come back to the battery. Okay, the battery, you can't see the battery when you, not even when you pre-flight, you can't see it. You'd have to pop the cowling off. Um, but it's an, it's, it's an essential part of the electrical system, um, this uh, storage battery. Its main purpose is to provide a means for starting the engine. But it also permits limited operation of electrical components, such as radios, without starting the engine. Uh, in addition, uh, the battery is a valuable source of standby or emergency electrical power in case the alternator fails. So it's for redundancy. If the engine is turning, th this is an engine-driven alternator, so it's going to be producing electrical energy. Again, the battery, when we start, is a full cup of water. But then when you start cranking, just like your car, you're taking a sip out of the water. If it stops like on a cold day and you got to try two or three times to attempt to start it, you're just taking another sip of water. Once the engine starts spinning, the alternator is going to re refill the cup of water. So that's how I want you guys to think about this. All right. The ammeter. All right, let's take a look at the ammeter in the aircraft. All right, the ammeter is over here, and let's go to the instructor side, which is the right seat, All right. and let's see if we can't zoom in on this. P3D is giving me drama today, okay. Now, if you have a high voltage condition, this light will light up. So, it will probably go to the plus side if that happened, and this light would light off. And that will tell you, hey, we have a high voltage condition, which is not good. Typically, where we want this needle is right in the middle. Okay. Once we fire the bat, once we start it, start the propeller spinning, and um, we've sipped some water out of it, we've taken a gulp of water out of that battery. Like I said, think of that battery as a glass of water. Um, you should see this go to the plus side. That that, that tells you that that the amateur. 
the amateur is telling you, hey, the alternator is feeding that water back to the system. So let's talk about the amateur. An amateur is used to monitor electrical current in amperes within the system. Actually, there are two types of amateurs. One reflects current flowing to or from the battery. The other type simply displays the load placed on the alternator and is referred to as a load meter. So you see this am amperes or amperes. This is an amateur. An amateur measures amperes. If it was a load meter, um, then it would say load meter. All right. Um, and if it was a load meter, then it would display the load place on the alternator. Um, so, a little note here. When the pointer of the ammeter is on the left, it's on the plus side. And that would be the dial's left. It's on the plus side. It shows charging rate of the battery. A minus indication means more current is being drawn from the battery than is being replaced. If we see a minus. That's another bad condition. That's why I said we want it in the middle. The load meter, and we're not going to talk about the load meter because we're not operating with the load meter, but um, we'll kind of discuss that later on when we go into bigger or more sophisticated aircraft with load meters. All right. So a charging ammeter, when it's charging, uh, the needle's on the plus side. It's normal following engine start. So like I said, once we sip that water out of the battery, the ammeter, the ammeter's going to be like, hey, we're charging. It's going to go to the plus side just a little bit. It shouldn't go over there crazy. It should just creep over a little bit to say, hey, we're putting the water back in the battery. Um, after the battery is charged, we fill the cup of water up as the battery. The ammeter should stabilize near zero, and the alternator will supply the electrical needs of the system. A discharging ammeter, meaning that the electrical load is exceeding the output of the alternator, um, and the battery is helping the electrical system. So after we get things rolling and this propeller is moving, and it's operating the engine driven alternator, you really shouldn't have a discharge. The battery shouldn't be helping out. And then if it is, um, then that's an issue, which you can discuss with your, your instructor. All right. But this may mean um, that the alternator is malfunctioning or the electrical load is excessive. In any event, you should reduce your electrical load to conserve battery power and land as soon as practical. If this condition happens, then that means that your electrical system is degrading, okay, and you want to land as soon as practical. It's not like an emergency emergency, like, okay, you've lost an engine or something like that, but you want to be, if you have communication and navigation radios, you want to be able to use them, and if you can't use them because your electrical system is degrading, i.e. high voltage or irregular amateur reading, then it's like, hey, look, we need to return to base. We need to get back. And then you can use your radios, and um, they should function um, to get you back. All right. Let's talk about the master switch. Okay. The master switch is very, very interesting. Um, let's see if we can't come on down to it. Yes, we can. Very good. Okay. You can see it labeled master switch. Okay. We have the ability to... Simulation pause. Okay, we have the ability to turn the alternator on independently or the battery on independently, but typically we rock these both up or both down. Now, in like some situation where the alternator was malfunctioning or failing, what you could do is just turn this into the off position and take it out of the electrical system. Okay, you could also take the battery out of the electric, electrical system, but let's say I'm 15 minutes away from the airport and my amateur, my amateur, my alternator is not functioning properly uh, by way of an amateur indication. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this out the system. So these will both be up. I'm 10, 15 minutes away from the airport. Boom, I'm rocking that down. And I'm going to operate off the battery power because I know for a fact that the battery is good or was good at some point. So as you are looking, uh, as you're flying your aircraft, you should constantly, constantly be looking at um, these systems. Uh, let's come back to virtual cockpit. We were already in virtual cockpit. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So, um, so you're going to constantly almost kind of look in here periodically, and your head's going to go outside, and you're going to be looking outside of the aircraft as well as you're flying through the air. So I always refer to it as like being a closed circuit camera, and you're just looking outside for traffic and you're scanning inside for instruments as well um, to make sure that you are getting proper engine indications. Your oil temperature is good. Your oil pressure is good. Then look back outside and look around. Okay, there's no airplanes near me. Come back look at the fuel gauges. The fuel is good. Look around. Check, look at your flight instruments and stuff like that. But your instructor will teach you how to scan, and it will become second nature to you. All right. So the master switch, let's... Uh, go into the master switch a little bit since we talked about it and let's turn that master switch back into the off so this whole thing is the master switch but you can independently turn the alternator and the battery into the on positions okay the master switch controls the entire electrical system the airplane's ignition system is independent of the electrical system so even if this is off even if this is off and say we're in flight, the propeller, as long as there's fuel, it's still going to keep, it's still going to keep going. The engine is still going to keep going. All right, so that's what we mean by that when we say that the uh, ignition system is independent of the electrical system, because of magnetos, which are just basically spark plugs, supply the current, or the magnet. I'm sorry, the magnetos supply current to the spark plugs. However, the engine starter won't operate unless the master switch is on because of the power for the uh, starter uh, comes from the electrical system. So let's come back to our schematic and we can see our starter here. All right, so we have our battery, our alternator, our starter. Um, the magnetos we talked about, they supply energy to the spark plugs. All right, and we can see the ignition switch, which is your key, the key position, all right? Um, all right, so during normal operations, both sides of the master switch are on. Right, let's come back to our simulation. So when we're in operation, both of these are, sorry, rocked up into the up position. All right. And if you've ever follow, followed me on one of my videos, actually during the engine start, these are rocked up because we need that uh, in order for the, and let's just test something out. See, nothing is happening. You can turn this. And I wanted you to also know that you have left and right ma magnetos, all right, that supply power to the spark plugs. Um, the magnetos are they're dual magnetos, so it's like a dual system that is going to supply electrical energy to the spark plugs. And um, we'll go into that in detail. But your aircraft, your key or ignition switch could be in the off position the right position for the right magnetos, the left position powering the left magnetos, or both. All right, so when we start, we start, and then when we let it go, it's going to roll back into the both position. This is the normal position, so both magnetos are operating or supplying um, electrical energy to the spark plugs to keep that propeller turning. All right. Um, let's see. During normal pilot operations, both sides of the master switch are on in case of um, alternator malfunction. It can be turned off to isolate it from the system. We talked about that. If you want to check equipment on the ground before you start the engine, you can uh, select only the battery side. Now, typically, when I want to get ATIS, which is the Automatic Terminal Information Service, let's go to, um, oh, this is not going to come up. All right. Um, I wish I had a chart clip, but no worries. 
Um, if we wanted to listen to Adis, okay, we could rock this into the on position. So the master switch is entirely in the on position. Then we can go to our communication radios, and I'll just come up with a frequency, 133.7. So you go to your communication radio, and the frequency you want to listen to is 133.7. I'm just going to put that in, for example, right? The engine does not need to be on. We don't need to be sucking fuel in order to listen to ATIS, or maybe get an IFR clearance, or maybe talk to... I don't know, the flight stand, I mean, the um, Unicom, which your fuel guys and your catering guys and things of that nature. <laughs> you could talk to the guy and you could say, I don't know, uh, say like Trenton Mercer Airport, Trenton Unicom, November 625 Delta Lima, and you just listen. And I'll be like, uh, November 625 Delta Lima, this is Trenton Unicom. How can we help you? Um, yeah, uh, I like uh, to be topped off. Let's say your fuel is low and you need to get gas, okay? So you don't need your engine to be burning fuel um, just to be sitting on the ground, all right? When you get done, you turn it off, and you can turn your master off. Another thing that typically uh, happens is when we do a pre-flight, when, uh, when you're doing a pre-flight, okay, you want your flaps to be extended so you can inspect them. Okay, so when you do that, you turn your master on and your flaps. And you can see the flaps coming down. Okay, and this is for your pre-flight inspection. So you will typically do this in your pre-flight. You turn your master on, you'll check your fuel quantities You'll check your fuel quantities while the master is on, and then after you get your flaps down, you can turn it back off, right? Now, I can try to operate this switch, right? Sorry about that. That was the wrong button. But the switch is not going to move. The flaps are not going to move. The radio, you can turn it into the on position, but there's no electrical energy because the master is off. If we turn it back on, then the radios come back on. You can turn the ADF the ADF was in the on position um, and we can bring our transponder up okay um, just want to make sure I hit everything on the master switch finally circuit breakers your aircraft could have circuit breakers or fuses in this particular case this particular aircraft has circuit breakers let me explain okay um, I can't it'd be nice if I could take these out like I could do control unit but if we look at the circuit breakers, the circuit breakers tell you every appliance that it is protecting. Okay. You gently just take your thumb and you rub them across like this. You rub them across. So as you're rubbing them across, you're applying some pressure, put, pushing them in, in a little bit. And if they pop out, you'll see orange. That's what you can't see. You can't see the orange, but when they pop all the way out, you'll see orange, and that's like, hey, something's wrong. Okay, so the alternator, let's push this in, okay. Let's push this in as well. We can see them better. So this circuit breaker is protecting the alternator. This is protecting the fuel indicator. This is protecting the beacon and the pitot heat. This is protecting the strobe lights. This is protecting the landing light. So if the electrical energy surges somehow, we don't damage these components. This will pop out and say, hey, too much voltage. I'm out. We, it's protecting it. Um, instrument lights, navigation dome light, radios one, two, and three. All right. And let's see if we look up. Can we look up? No, we can't look up. All right. Because we're just on the panel. So each circuit breaker is telling you what it's protecting. Um, so fuel indicator, beacon, pitot. Like I said, it, it protects the flashing beacon and the pitot heat. The strobe. Strobe lights uh, and the cigarette lighter. Take off, uh, take off landing and taxi lights. And your flaps. Let's come back. 
So multimeter, fuel indicator, beacon, strobes, landing lights. Okay. So I didn't see flaps though. And that may be a simulation thing. Fuel indicator, beacon, okay, I didn't see flaps. And that might just be the layout of this simulator. Okay, that's fine. Um, but get familiar with your electrical system. All right, nav dome, radios one, two, three, four, uh, if they're protected, in this case is one, two, three. So nav dome, one, two, three, four. All right, this is your secondary bus. Typically, all right, this is your primary bus. This is your secondary uh, bus bar. All right, and we just protect electrical equipment. Here's a cigarette lighter here, and we don't use that typically. Most people do not smoke in their airplanes um, because the vacuum system sucks in air from the cockpit, and that gunk could uh, potentially build up in your gyroscopic uh, instruments, the ones that are vacuum powered, which is the attitude indicator and the directional gyro, but let's stay on point with the electrical system. All right, so circuit breakers and fuses. As the electrical system schematic shows, okay, let's look at it. As the electrical system shows, Circuit breakers or fuses are used to protect various components from overloads. With circuit breakers, resetting the breaker usually will reactivate the circuit unless an overloaded or short circuit exists. If this is the case, the circuit breaker will continue to pop, indicating an electrical problem. Manufacturers usually provide a holder for spare fuses in the event you need to replace a fuse in flight. In fact, Federal Aviation Regulations require that you carry extra fuses for night flight. Okay. And we'll talk about that when we get into regulations as far as, you know, spare fuses needed. Um, in some airplanes, certain electrical systems, certain electrical system problems may be signal by the illumination of a low voltage warning light. We talked about a warning light, but in that particular panel it's a high voltage. You should prefer, or I'm sorry, refer to the pilot operating handbook for a thorough description of normal and emergency operations for the electrical system. So that's an electrical system in a nutshell. Now you can go into your manual in section 7 of the electrical system and you just go down a little bit and it will tell you in detail everything that goes on with this particular aircraft. All right. Um, it talks about the ground service plug receptacle. All right. Sometimes the cold weather starting, we can plug in, uh, we can plug into the aircraft if your particular aircraft has, has one. All right. Pause for a second. Hey, Jay, I'm in the middle of a video. I'll call you right back. All right, I'll be back. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so um, it goes into lighting systems, interior lighting, um, pretty much everything um, electrical at that point. All right, so you can go into and you can read this, but it's basically talking about everything I covered. All right. Um, let me see. I'm just scanning through these paragraphs and making sure I did not miss anything. But you can read through this on your own. All right. So if you guys have any questions about the electrical system, any electrical system, all right, um, I just have to be able to get to the the pilot operating handbook, which I have many in PDF format and I can do videos on. But if you don't understand this, rewind the video, take notes. But you really ha need to understand how this electrical system works. Uh, let me see. And wow. I think I only had one instance 
where I actually had an electrical system failure. And I'm trying to think what happened here. I'm trying to remember what happened. Okay. Um, the radios were just getting really, really wacky. And actually, they were dimming off. They were actually getting dim, dim on me. So if I see lights dim, that's telling me, like, okay, this thing is not getting enough electrical energy to keep these lights powered up. So actually, I was outside of Class D airspace, and we'll, we'll talk about airspace and stuff. And I actually got my clearance before I entered the airspace. I explained to them that, hey, that's my home base. Um, and so I talked to the tower. I said, listen, uh, we're 10 miles to the west. We're inbound full stop. We'd already gotten the automatic terminal information service. Okay. So... Even if the electrical system degrades, the propeller is not going to stop spinning as long as there's fuel. All right. So basically, what the plan was, was for me to circle the airport and look for a light gun signal from the tower. And so the, they could communicate with me via light gun signals and, um, and give me landing clearance. When I see the, the landing si signal... That tells me I'm cleared to land. Then, you know, boom. I already knew the active runway. I, ex I explained that to the controller. So when I was 10 miles out, I had my clearance. And he told me, okay, you're cleared to enter the class delta. Uh, circle a pattern at 1,500 feet. And plan for runway 5. Okay. So, and he told me traffic. Maintain left-hand traffic. I think the, tra the actual pattern was right-hand traffic, but he put me in left-hand traffic to keep me away from other aircraft. All the other aircraft that had communication abilities, they were good in that right-hand pattern, but he put me in the left-hand pattern. And when he saw me when he saw me up there circling in his airspace at 1,500 feet, after he got a couple airplanes down, boom, I got the light gun signal, and I was cleared to land, and everybody you know, went home, walked away safe. It was not an extreme dangerous situation because when I saw the radios degrading, you know, it was just like, okay, let's call the tower now and let's make a plan. So you always got to keep a cool head uh, when you're up there. Okay, so yeah, we really didn't do any flying, but we are, we're in France. And I guess the next video, I guess we'll do something out of this airport. But, um, um, I can't stress enough how important it is to understand your electrical systems. And um, if you have any comments, questions, or anything like that, just let me know. Um, pretty soon on my website, it's thinmokino.com, there will be a donation page. Because it takes a lot of time, energy, and effort. And, you know, I appreciate anything you guys can do in the way of donations. Um, because after this private pilot grant school... It's also going to be an instrument pilot ground school and a commercial pilot ground school and a multi-engine as well. Um, so we really, really want to uh, provide videos that you guys can use to help enhance your flight training and stuff like that. Because in a lot of cases, on your phone, you can just play the video and just listen. You know, you can just listen and just slowly play these over and over and over again, and you can absorb the info. So I'm Kino with stemwithkino.com, and I really, really appreciate you guys taking time out to check this video out. Thank you very much. Please like, share, subscribe on your social media networks. And if you want to be updated um, with videos that I do, especially for these ground schools, if you are on Facebook, follow me at stemwithkino.com there and soon uh, to be Twitter. So stemwithkino.com on Facebook and stemwithkino.com on Twitter if you want to stay up to date with my latest videos. I thank you guys very much and have a great evening. Bye-bye.